Yeah, I could also entitle this speech to be during my adventures with Hans Hermann. And uh, we'll sip through two decades, I guess, or even more. Three. <laughs> uh, because it all started in Stuttgart, where I did my PhD, my habilitation, and we went together a workshop and traffic in Gwendolyn Flow. And here's some pictures taken at that time, not exactly at that workshop, so mm -hmm. cheating a little bit over here, but um, you get an impression of how we used to look like <laughs> 30 years ago. And already at that time, Hans was very much engaged, giving speeches and so on. And he was, of course, working on finding materials. And for example, he was interested in this Size segregation happens if you have a system with uh, different size particles and share the system. And the approach that Hans has taken at the time was very much based on molecular dynamics. And this is me at that time. You see, also a little bit engaged. <laughs> and um, I was applying the same thing to traffic and pedestrians, and that uh, happened to be my thesis. And Hans was actually one of the reviewers and was very much scared of him, you know, because he had so many critical questions. He was so super smart, and I always wanted to be like him. So he published uh, at least one paper a week. I had the impression, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, he was just in amazingly productive and all over the place, that means all over the world. And I was trying uh, to be as good as he was, and uh, he was very much inspired for me. And um, I was a very good force in my career. And yeah, talking about forces, of course, uh, I've been working on the social force model for pedestrians. And so we were, of course, inspired by physics, and the idea was that we could understand the walking behavior of people through forced equations, an equation of motion for pedestrian alpha, that means uh, location changes would be given by the speed, okay, that's kind of sure, but then the question was how to specify the acceleration. And we decided uh, to uh, formulated as a superposition of different kind of forces that would describe different effects on uh, people's behavior. Uh, for example, the effect of interaction with other pedestrians beta or the interaction with boundaries, and we assume repulsive effects, and we also assume that people, as compared to particles, would have goals, destinations, and they wanted to get uh, into a certain direction of motion, the alpha not, and um, they would have a certain desired speed, the alpha not, and it would take some time to adjust the actual speed uh, to the desired speed, and so on. So in the beginning, these were assumptions, and we did simulations later on. In fact, we even did experiments, and we analyzed trajectories, and it turned out that a lot of the assumptions that we made uh, at that time are still being used and have been confirmed empirically and experimentally. Of course, in the meantime, there's some evolution of the modeling effort. But anyway, there's still a lot of people who are fascinated by self-organization phenomena in pedestrian crowds. And similar to the size segregation here, we find over here a separation of the different walking directions into lanes. And in fact, that paper was published around 1995. There were several papers looking at different kinds of things. But this actually became a, one of the uh, milestone papers of PRE. It collected quite a few citations. In fact, even though it, it seems to be such an unusual <coughs> subject in physics. We also found uh, some other phenomena, such as oscillations that bottlenecks again are <laughs> organized as you can see over here and we like that very much and we'll mm -hmm. see that we learned from this actually that we can build self-organized traffic light control that would use this pressure principle that caused self-organized 
oscillations to come up with a very efficient traffic light control that works in a decentralized way and is actually implemented <coughs> in Dresden and uh, soon in Lucerne, maybe also uh, Zurich and other places. So Stefan Lemmer is really the key person with a PhD in my team <coughs> at that time. And yes, but lane formation oscillation is not the only thing that we discover. There's also spike formation phenomena that means if there is two crossing flows of people, then <coughs> it's possible that people cross the other stream without even stopping, right? So they would move forward with such a stripe, but sideways within the stripe, and in such a way it's really possible to cross a flow without stopping. It's amazing, right? If you had to figure it out, it would take a long time, I guess, um, but we just do it automatically based on interaction. Another subject that I was interested at in, uh, in at the time in Stuttgart was traffic flow. And uh, eventually it was a review of motor physics article. Actually, this was summarizing everything I've learned in the Stuttgart Times. And also a popular article, what we found was a surprising richness of different congestion patterns and we decided that we should try to decompose complex congestion patterns into elementary patterns so, uh, as physicists basically try to understand properties of matter based on properties of elementary particles. And so we actually managed not only to simulate these elementary patterns, we actually did that before we had the data, so that was kind of predictive, um, and also um, we, we compare that later on with empirical data. So you can do that kind of simulation with different kinds of models, for example, microscopic models, such as the intelligent driver model. And again, you have an equation of motion and acceleration equation and a car following aspect. And then you can predict what will happen under certain kind of flow conditions if you have a freeway with an on-ramp where there's some incoming vehicles. So basically you have the upstream flow on the freeway, the inflow through the ramp. The sum of both is basically the overall traffic volume. So if you go up in the air, you will get into areas of high traffic volume and from free traffic flow to congested traffic. And those different kinds of congestion patterns, you can see there's multi-stability, it all depends on how big is the perturbation, not only how big are the two flows, but there is a prediction of what will happen under what kind of conditions, and then eventually we did this hard work to gather data sets and to evaluate the data sets, and actually it turns out to fit the theory very well. And that also was published in Science. And uh, there is now an analytical theory of traffic flow, a collection of eight papers, I believe. And uh, we can say that even though traffic flows are complex systems, we can understand the main features analytically. And we have theories that allow us to predict extensions and delays by traffic jams and I think this is uh, really a nice achievement but we didn't leave it there we also started to think about ways to get rid of those traffic jams so we were assuming that cars would get smarter and smarter I would have was still at times where nobody was talking about Google <laughs> self-driving cars we assume cars would have onboard data acquisition, something like perception, inter-vehicle communication was tested already at that time. We assume that there would be cognition, maybe based on putting data of several vehicles together, it means a collective cognition, and then decision making, and driver assistance, or automatic driving. And we tested that even on roads at that time. 
So it was not just a computer simulation such as this one. And here you first get a demonstration of our understanding of stop and go traffic, which unfortunately happens still every day because our freeways are not very well organized. And we'll see in a minute what is the reason for this terrible congestion. So we'll leave the car, we'll take the helicopter now. And uh, we can see now that there is an on-ramp, there are some vehicles that are trying to get on the freeway, which produces small disruptions in the traffic flow on the freeway, and those disruptions are being amplified, and that causes some stop and go traffic. Now, without changing the inflows, we'll change the interactions between the vehicles now. Well, we add some radar sensors that measure distances and relative velocities and let the cars accelerate and decelerate automatically um, according to a certain formula. And even if we only equipped 30% of those vehicles, we would be able to dissolve the traffic jams. How do, do, how do we do this? Basically, by real-time measurement and real-time feedback. So we're changing the interactions between the vehicles in such a way that self-organization would lead to a favorable outcome, namely free traffic flow. And then eventually I got a chair of sociology at ETH Zurich. <laughs> uh, may you know this chair that was standing in front of the hotel Zurich Park. So I had to grow into this, you know. <laughs> And so we went big. <laughs> the first thing we did is we established this competence center coping with crisis and complex socioeconomic system. Hans were, was part of it. And here are the others. So we were six people all together. We successfully raised some money and we were all extremely ambitious and everyone was publishing papers like hell and everyone wanted to publish more papers than the others and uh, here are all the people and here are the PhDs who the postdocs uh, included who of course did a lot of the work with us and with a lot of fun and we learned a lot and then eventually this competence center was closed down to give place to an even bigger Competence Center, the Risk Center, and Hans Gerstoff, for example, was also part of it, and many other people that you know of. So here you can see all the faces, and then we were interested in complex interdependencies and in complex systems. So we realized that networking is good, but can you promote cascading effects? And uh, Next week we'll have again a meeting of the World Economic Forum. They always publish these risk maps and you can see that basically every system is somehow stronger or weaker connected to every other system so they can occur all sorts of cascading effects and things are getting more and more serious the more connected the world gets. So here's just an analysis of what may happen in case of an earthquake. We analyzed reports of many earthquakes and what happened in the aftermath. And you can s identify a causality network, basically what leads to what, and you can take anticipated measures basically before the next bricks fall, or the next dominoes fall. You can be there and try to prevent it from happening. <coughs> Here you see some com common elements of many disasters and worst comes to worse. One disaster may trigger another disaster. For example, an earthquake could cause a volcanic eruption. It could uh, cause uh, tsunamis and floods and all sorts of things and uh, gas pipes might break and so on and so on and so on. So it's good to know this beforehand so you can prepare for these kind of events. And one of the problems that both Hans and I were interested in were electrical uh, blackouts and power grids. And so if that happens, basically, yes, of course, the traffic lights will be off, gas stations will be out of order, public and private transport will be down, will be disruption of uh, the 
cellular phone network and um, pumps will be without power so you have to boil water and you have to do that basically with um, gas and then um, there would be more fires and firefighters would uh, have to come and save you uh, in case of such a situation so things can get quite complicated and bad in a very short time of course um, people like Hans and myself and many others have been working on cascading effect in electrical power grid so if there's a local overload that could uh, cause an overload elsewhere and then really as this simulation by another team shows very astonishing dynamics can happen where basically a blackout down there in Spain that can actually trigger a blackout in Eastern Europe and you wouldn't really think that such a thing would happen right and those things do happen actually it turned out that on November 4, 2006, a ship had to cross a certain point and they had to turn off one power line and that caused a cascading effect, even though they made some analysis before, uh, but they didn't expect the combination of reaching off this line and a random failure. And suddenly you had blackouts all over Europe down to Spain, even though it all started in Germany, right? Of course, Hans was there to save the world, and he came up uh, with uh, ways basically to change the network, of the, the power grid in such a way that you could mitigate the situation, you could make these power grids much more robust. <coughs> But that was not all. Eventually we decided we would go really big and it was this flagship competition and so with the Future ICT project we applied for this 1 billion euro project and we came into the final round as you know. Uh, we had really big plans, we wanted to create a planetary nervous system to measure what's going on in the world and we wanted to create a living earth simulator in order to uh, look into a possible future to be able to choose uh, favorable scenarios and we wanted uh, to create uh, a global participatory platform that would allow everyone to benefit from that kind of technology and the uh, project was big and so it had many different focus areas it was also social inspired ICT and global system science and we wanted to build various ex not exploratories but as exploratories for financial systems, health and epidemics, crime and conflict with um, resilience, sustainable cities, smart energy systems, environment and sustainability, we want to create an innovation accelerator and across everything there would be ethics and integration and you all know how it ended. We didn't quite make it. Um, uh, it was very close. The uh, Human Brain Project got the funding, and the uh, Arfim Project, that was uh, the illustration that ETH was publishing at that time. And of course, uh, we never give up, right? That's why we are scientists. And so the first thing that I did is I built the SWAT team, you know, students working against time. And Lucas, who is sitting in this audience, uh, was one of those student assistants who were helping really to push scientific progress ahead uh, with their help. And you know, nothing could scare him, as you can see. And uh, one of the papers that was published at that time uh, was this nature perspective, globally networked risks and how to respond. And so it said that uh, today strongly connected global networks have produced highly independent systems that we do not understand and cannot control well. These systems are vulnerable to failure at all scales, posing serious threats to society even when external shocks are absent. 
as the complexity and interaction strengths in our network will increase, man-made systems can become unstable, creating uncontrollable situations even when decision makers are well skilled, have all data and technology at their disposal and do their best. And to make this system manageable, we would basically have to redesign those systems. We were calling for global system science, as we were asking the question, have humans created something like a global time bomb in, uh, in voluntarily, of course, by connecting systems more and more, such that cascading effects were more and more likely and less and less controllable. And we are probably in a situation which pretty much is like this. If you look at this fake news epidemics, I think this is a uh, result of urban connectivity and of course you know all this beautiful work by the robots and others um, <laughs> on the scaling laws and to the implications depending on the different scaling exponents. So uh, under certain circumstances there would not be even a mean value or a va variance well defined. And so anything could happen in those systems. And as a result, we were looking into systems that would produce all sorts of surprises. For example, these kinds of um, cooperation problems. People interact with their neighbors, as you will see in a second. Blue means cooperative behavior, red means non-cooperative behavior, and black is not occupied. Oh, I So in, in the beginning we see there's a lot of defection, cooperation is lacking, but eventually, in particular, if we add a few links to the network, we'll see cooperation spread. So now there is quite a few blue sites and eventually it's the majority of sites, right? And we go on connecting the system more and more and it turns out that unfortunately cooperation gets lost. That means more connectivity is not necessarily a good thing. There is an optimal degree of connectivity and so maybe we have overconnected the world and destroyed a lot of cooperation by this unintentionally. Similar thing in systems where you could have epidemic breakouts. So, assume some people make air flights to other countries and uh, maybe they have the flu and so they would infect other people. And, you know, as, as long as there are little flights <coughs> in the system, yeah, it, it stays okay. You know, there are some people who are infected, but most people are healthy and. Uh, nothing bad here but eventually you know we would add those long-range connections and uh, people would dislocate themselves to other places and uh, if there are a few connections it's okay but if there are a few connections too much then it can end this way so that was the kind of uh, stuff that was really getting our interest at that time and we published also this paper about disease induced resource constraints that could trigger explosive epidemics unfortunately at that time when we wanted to publish this there was just this Ebola breakout and everyone thought we would had this Ebola uh, thing in mind and that was not uh, actually the intention but anyway so it, it got published and uh, you can see that there are these kind of discontinuous uh, transitions over here due to the hitting of the resource constraints. We've also been looking in other kinds of systems which would produce power law behavior but without thresholds built into the model and for this we have been looking at that multiparticle system, a one-dimensional one where basically each particle would be fixed to a location with a string and they could collide with each other and there could also be a random influence on the behavior and if you simulate it then you get basically 
this behavior over here. So this turns out to be a, a version of Newton's cradle, and you can see that those particles at the boundaries really have sometimes very big uh, amplitudes, while the ones in the middle have small amplitudes. And this is exactly what uh, our study was about. So we found those parallel behaviors, in particular if you get go to bigger and bigger systems. And now Lucas uh, was not busy enough with this, so we started to look into other kinds of problems such as the Erasmus Mobility Program. That was basically a data science study and he discovered that female students are overrepresented in the Erasmus program, systematic across subject areas and also across countries. So uh, they're really adventurous, I should say. Now eventually, even though we didn't get the money for the Future ICT project, we can say that a lot of things happened throughout Europe and elsewhere. Data science spread, computational social science was established as a fastly growing field. Uh, global system science made its way looking into all sorts of data, spreading of scientific innovation, spreading of memes, spreading of culture, <coughs> the epidemic spreading, and so on. And, and social physics also made its way and got uh, kind of popular attention through the book of Sandy Pentland, even though uh, he was neither a physicist nor a social scientist. Uh, <laughs> his uh, book uh, got quite some attention. And then the Singapore ETH Center on Sustainable Development was established. Uh, you can see one of the figures that uh, Dirk Brockman had produced in collaboration with me. And then uh, even Frank Schweitzer started organizing uh, computational social science symposia. And if you go to the homepage of ETH search, you would probably find this thing over here, which also shows a picture that was created in collaboration of our team with Max Schick and, uh, that appeared in Science. So, you know, this has all been spreading all over the place. Now, of course, in the meantime, we're living in a time of big data. And in the beginning of those times, people like Cindy Pentland thought eventually you would have kind of God's eyes view and we could know everything. And exploratories were built also, as far as I can tell, the central nervous system was built in a living earth simulator, but unfortunately not available for the scientists like you and me or the general public. The amounts of data became so big that one needed to have new technologies uh, to evaluate the data. Artificial intelligence made its way. People are expecting super intelligent systems too, and those systems are so good at learning and uh, are using so much data also about each of us that they learn how to manipulate our opinions and decisions and behaviors and even elections as we learned in connection with Cambridge Analytica. So personalized information is guiding our thinking in a sense and some people were even thinking of society like a giant machine that could now be controlled by a huge AI system to behave in certain kinds of ways. And uh, eventually people got concerned. So for example, this Enigma project by Sandy Pentland uh, that was basically looking into a scenario which we will see flash up in a second. So in the background there was Bantam Spun Opticum, kind of the perfect person now digitally implemented and of course uh, that had to be changed and uh, there was a fierce discussion about the digital future that we would enter and uh, how it would look like and my argument was that <coughs> even though we would have more processing power than ever and more data 
then in the entire history of humankind, we would still lose control of this planet if we try to control it in a top-down way because systemic complexity would increase factorially even faster than exponential and as a result um, yeah there, there was just not enough processing power in data and one needed a new control paradigm which is basically distributed control and self-organization that brings us back to the things that uh, we discussed before and it became clear that we would have to think about ethical ICT, desire for values, digital democracy, and all of this. And um, in fact, uh, that was making me busy in the past years. And we published this digital manifest in Spectrum der Wissenschaft that uh, made a splash and uh, created quite a bit of political upheaval, I would say. And uh, you can see it triggered off a lot of activities. For example, um, this Manifesto for Digital Democracy by the University of Zurich. And there was this uh, Digital Manifesto of Bern, where a lot of uh, high-ranking people, so-called digital shapers, were meeting. Uh, in the meantime, this is what you find on the internet. Uh, um, hopefully that's not a bad omen for the digital future of Switzerland but there were all these people you know you can see me in the background over here and a lot of those digital shapers that are pushing things ahead in Switzerland and that was basically the plan digital Switzerland built on freedom and initiative of everyone. That means a decentralized concept and hopefully you will have that and enjoy that together very soon. Uh, there were also uh, risk center workshops uh, on digital society and suddenly there were all sorts of initiatives on digital societies at Collegium Helveticum and uh, in Bern is, uh, there is a center for digital society and at the UZETA there is this digital society initiative so you know, it really cascaded in a sense and so basically there is a new paradigm to go away from top-down control to a culture of empowerment go away from this over-regulation by very detailed laws and instead an approach that would look for <laughs> system designs that support self-organization. In this case, of course, it's this unidirectional flow that we have in front and the unidirectional flow in the opposite direction that we have in the back and this little buffer in the middle that allows everyone to adjust the speed in such a way that we would find a gap to cross. And this is working surprisingly well. Of course, we can do that better <laughs> with technology, right? And so this self-organization principle that I showed you before, that pedestrians with oscillated bottlenecks, that can be transferred actually to the self-organization of intersections in cities. And uh, we've done this. and. Uh, the success is tremendous. You can see a lot of savings of travel time, public transport, even uh, improvement for motorized traffic, even though they were green waves before, and also improvement for pedestrian cyclists and for the environment. And so that brings us to one more paper that uh, I've written with Hans. It's a fun paper. But actually, not, not taken too seriously. We just like to explore what happens in certain kind of settings. In this case, we were basically combining opposite flows of pedestrians with the redshift dynamics. And it turns out that this is uh, stabilizing the uh, lanes. And uh, then years later, unexpectedly, we got an email that said, you know, we have implemented it. So SPB, uh, the Swiss uh, train operation company, was inviting us. And you can see we, we all uh, tried out their 
virtual reality environment where they have been testing their solution beforehand and it's there. <laughs> it, it, it really exists. So you, you see it in the background. It looks a little bit different from uh, how we had simulated things, but anyway, it was really funny to see how people were inspired by a paper. Uh, usually, uh, people in a business would probably not read and see, you know, little by little, your publications can change the world. Now, one of the most exciting uh, travels I've done was actually to Brazil. Hans invited me over, and so I was to talk about the next civilization. I was in a public theater in Fortaleza. I can see a really a big event. I think the first event in a series of. Uh, events that were to come up and I talked about data and digital revolution and all this and uh, a short time later I think uh, a few minutes were actually spent on new research and data infrastructures. I'm finishing up uh, with how this trip actually continued so uh, we were going to Rio de Janeiro and uh, we were meeting the people from Schwissnex who were kind enough to organize this event and then eventually we were also visiting this uh, statue of Christ and that allows me to close the circle because that was about the time where people were saying you know these super intelligent systems they would be like an AI God that knows everything better than a human would know and it would tell us how to live and if we wouldn't live as that AI God would tell us we would get minus points in the citizen score which is currently tested as you know in, in China in some places so we were in the situation <laughs> where some people from Google and elsewhere were starting to believe yes we are all part of a huge network of people. We are now all one organism in a sense, and the only thing that's needed to coordinate those different cells of the organism that we would be would be kind of a super brain to control that super organism. And I said, mm, not not sure this is the way we want to live. And so, dear Hans, uh, I'd like to dedicate these two books to you. Um, Actually, you know these people. It's just uh, Vincent Sarf, the uh, father of the internet. This is Nelly Kroos. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, There's some questions. Are there comments? Or? Yes. I have a question. Well, you have these uh, two completely contradictory strategies of one the control by AE and the other one by the self organization of mm -hmm. the basis. So, which of the ones is going to be more significant cascading effects? I mean, in, in that other book, The Automation of Society is Next, I'm contrasting exactly these two ways um, of automation. Yeah. The one through a centralized control and the other one by bottom up self organization. I guess we'll eventually have a combination of both, but we need to have sufficient degrees of freedom to allow for innovation that allows us to solve the problems of the world. I, I think a lot of problems can be addressed with decentralized approaches, and I feel much more comfortable about them because they cannot easily be misused by raw political or other powers that uh, would be in control mm -hmm. of those infrastructures and um, I think complex uh, systems are something that will have to be studied much more in the future and complexity science will have a good future ahead but we need to teach it much more I mean it's relevant for physicists it's relevant for chemists, it's relevant for people in, in medicine, in, in history, in political science, in social science, in um, biology, evolutionary theory, but most people don't learn it. And I think this really has to change because if you don't know about the way complex systems behave and work, 
and how can you, if you can use those success principles of complex systems, then you would get many things wrong and a, lo a lot of policy features I think are based on a lack of understanding of how complex systems work. So, yeah, second thing, uh, self-organization I think is the mm -hmm. No, not necessarily so. Uh, you, you could basically make uh, connectivity costly, right? So if, if you had to, uh, have to pay a little bit for a link to, then basically you would start thinking about which links do I really need? And uh, you, you would um, impose reasonable self-constraints no government would have to do that. You would just think who, who are, uh, the, the people I need to connect to and not just add more and more links in, right? So basically news, whatever news you post would spread without any control. And that's this the thing that kind of... of I mean, you look, to, to today basically um, Google and Facebook and other companies are trying to come up with information filters, right? And they basically use AI and other systems to censor information that's being spread through social networks and so on. Um, maybe we don't need this at all. I, s I think the fake news epidemic is basically caused by a combination of two things. First of all, fake news are often more interesting than real news. <laughs> so uh, people tend to, to read it and to share it. And the other thing is um, we have uh, a, a power law network through which this news is spreading and it's overconnected and probably has an exponent that's in the dangerous regime which uh, doesn't allow you to stop the cascades. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we have the fake news epidemic. So if you change the exponent of that network, things would probably go away. And um, so basically, if we would all get rid of those links that really don't matter for us, we would have a, a different topology and different exponent. And we wouldn't need to have censorship in uh, AI-based filters. They don't anyway work very well. Right? Thank you. I think, yeah, both can short, and then we have to move on. The, the largest experiment is this dystopian future, which is going on at the moment, is in China. Uh, would you uh, predict that it breaks down, or is this only wishful thinking on my side? <laughs> I think uh, they have done experiments and came to the conclusion that maybe this is not the best thing that we can do on our planet uh, with the use of AI. Why am I daring to say this? Because <laughs> there's a translation of this book I bought into Chinese. And you know, we got this offer for the Chinese translation on the day when the Chinese president uh, Xi Jinping was in Washington to visit Donald Trump. 
and then uh, okay, this contract was signed and we should have received the translation a long time ago but everything was delayed and we got the translation on the day when the Chinese president was made uh, a president for lifetime. Oh, on that very day we got the translation. And then um, it took uh, many months and there were always delays and so on and actually the contract wasn't valid anymore and uh, so we went back to them and uh, now it seems like they're going to publish this before the Chinese New Year. And uh, what I expect is that uh, there would be a new policy, a new way of using artificial intelligence that would probably be announced next week in Davos, in the World Economic Forum. I, I guess that somehow the world powers have found an agreement how to use that kind of technology in a better way. And so please keep your fingers crossed. Okay, well, I think we have to move on and uh, we're getting more and more behind schedule, but the talks are all very exciting. So thank you very much. <laughs> so,